My name is Steve Peterson. I'm a supporter of the Institute for Advanced Study. I first came to know the Institute for Advanced Study, I think it was about the time of the, the, the Great Recession. There were a series of programs on the university campus dealing with, uh, with the economy at that time and various measures that the legislature was taking to address the Great Recession. And uh, one, of the, one of the programs that was advertised was a, a talk by, I believe her name was Karen Ho. Uh, who had done a, a study of the um, financial financial scene from Wall Street and was preparing a book. I think she was a fellow of the IAS that year. And uh, I thought that was an engaging presentation and it was topical and uh, it was uh, addressed at a level that, uh, uh, of a level of, for, the, for the layman that was right for me. And uh, since then, uh, as a matter of regular practice, I check the uh, university events website uh, once a week to see what uh, the IAS is offering on their uh, Thursdays at four presentations. And there's been a series of, of, for me, really engaging and interesting programs. One very memorable presentation was by a, a Princeton graduate student who was preparing a book on the, um, the, the, the the care and feeding of uh, French troops during World War I. He had found correspondence between the uh, field commanders and the, uh, and the quartermaster's office, uh, explaining the, the need of, to continue the, a certain quantity of wine deliveries to the trenches to keep up the spirits of the, uh, of the soldiers. And, and his theme was that the, that the it, it, they couldn't be assured of the performance of the army unless it was provisioned adequately, provisioned with wine. And he went so far, the correspondent suggested, so went so far as to suggest that the French should import wine to be, uh, to be served to the soldiers and that it was important that it be good wine. So one of the things that in point two that's really important <clears throat> is what we found is that there's now this, this Co not co-equal, but a reciprocal relationship starting to happen between the science, sub scientists involved and the art, artists involved, and that we're substantively, potentially sub substantively impacting each of our areas. So if Eddie comes out, one of the things that com comes forward here, um, one of the things that, or over the um, <laughs> one of the things that happened as we were doing the, um, the moving cell project, the tube idea, is that I started see, seeing that we needed to develop a technique of impact, the technique of hitting each other so that we could take impact. So one of the things we started learning is how can we create impacts without hurting each other, but really hitting each other. So one thing that we started doing is figuring out how can I hit Eddie without doing that and hurting him. But, and so something we did is we found if I just kind of open my elbow up like this, and I'll turn so everybody can see, Okay. And you, you've seen it before. Um, is that I can then go like that, and he, he can he, he feel this whole impact. We see it reverberate through his body, but it doesn't hurt him, right? The body is part, is, is very capable of taking these hits. So for me, in terms of the aesthetic place of it, when I look at a lot of theater, a lot of things that have fight choreography and things like that, when I watch that stuff, I, it makes me go cross-eyed, I just because it all looks choreographed. It doesn't ever look real. So we've been finding this ability to be able to hit each other, and then that developed into a new piece called Hit, which is this whole exploration of, of high, high impact punching and slapping and tackling that we're, we've done in a way that, if it's done right, doesn't hurt. You know, it might cause interesting sounds and sometimes... Yeah, sometimes a few broken capillaries and bruises and stuff like that, but nothing permanent and... <laughs> <laughs> That's not something you normally would associate with dance, not that kind of contact. But Carl did, and that resonated with, I guess, my own view of what the cell is like. You know, it did evolve into more of a research-directed project. It evolved away from that initial plan of a public performance, which actually has never happened. But that's okay. Um, instead, what happened was it started to get integrated into our own research, where we build computer and mathematical models to describe experiments. And 
these models get sophisticated enough that we have difficulty understanding how they're working sometimes, and they're slow to build, and in some cases to run on a computer. Uh, whereas with human movement-based modeling, body storming we started to call it because it involved brainstorming with our bodies, um, we could move fast, we could rapidly prototype different scenarios and debate rather quickly the assumptions and the rules of the mathematical model. If we choreographed, uh, say, a microtubule assembly, for example, uh, which not too many people are familiar with, um, but the people who are familiar with it, the experts, might actually have their own opinion about how it should look, and they might not agree with me. So now we might have some disagreement around how you choreograph a dance. A thought that had never occurred to me, but Carl kept you know, pushing me on. Yeah. So how it's this, this neck organ yeah. that we found, that was another, it was an accident. Uh -huh. Because I was preparing, I was looking at structures in the scanning microscope where I had it from little cuttlefish, I had to decapitate these things to put the head into the into the device to look at it. Yeah. But just because one time my hand slipped a little away mm -hmm. and I did the cut. Yeah. Is that how it happened? No, we've been talking about a similar thing. Uh, in art we call a, those things an event. Yeah, yeah. They're, one. they're making I think So a serendipity all, kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I think oh, we uh, my teacher used to say Try to find a way to trip yourself and get back up from that. And I think that's a kind of a similar process that uh, we work hard so that those events will happen. We'll be in a laboratory all day so that we'll catch that event. And in that event, the unexpected event is what takes us to the place that we never expected. Mm -hmm. And that's a really I mean, great it's the same event. thing. You come into the cephalopod research world as an outsider. Mm -hmm. And you don't care about the conventions that we have mm -hmm. to do mm -hmm. something. That's right. Mm -hmm. But that's a beauty mm -hmm. that's completely unbiased and, and that's right. you would probably never have decapitated the animal <laughs> the way I do it or other yeah. cephalopod people do it. Uh -huh. And that's why we never saw that organ. Uh -huh. Because we always destroyed it. <laughs> yeah. Well I mean that's right. I mean, you have to step out of your yeah. own shoes. Yeah. Yeah. To, to get some new ideas in a way, to think about something else. Um, my name is Joan Delick, and I became aware of IAS through the University uh, Retiree Volunteer Center. And so um, I came and I met some of the staff, and I was very impressed with how passionate they were about IAS. And then I, um, I started last year, and I was really, really um, amazed at the diversity of the topics and the scope of the presentations and the fact that people had you know, come from all over the country uh, over the course of the year to participate in this, these collaborative efforts. It's been um, educational in a very different way. Um, I remember um, the presentation on Sand Creek uh, which forced me to look at history a different way. When I was going through elementary and high school, history was one of those concepts where you had to remember dates and you really didn't understand the context of what was happening. So I found that a very interesting presentation. I find that um, there are um, different ways of learning nowadays than I was exposed to when I was younger. And I think IAS is a very, very good example of that. There has to be a moment, a moment when he admits to Andrea that he did not do this for noble reasons. He recanted because he was afraid of physical pain. Yeah. They showed him the instruments. Great! That's great, Ruth. That's our end. Galileo lives like all of us in the contradiction He's terrible, so we think, but then, no, he wrote the Discorsi while under house arrest. So there was good reason to capitulate, so we think he's good, but then we find out, no, he didn't do it for noble reasons. They showed him the instruments, fantastic. So, um, you come in here, okay, um, 
Galileo says he's been right. Excuse me, can I take this? Excuse me, please take that. Thank you. Galileo is sitting here. Right. There. Okay. Um, he has been working on uh, the discourse. It is very. You know, you're right, Ruth. It should be in the globe. Ruth is right again. Ruth is always right. So it's inside the globe. This is the globe. Okay. Go ahead. Start from the discourse. Discoursey. Wait. What? <laughs> the discoursey. What did you just find? <laughs> the discoursey? No. You just found a dirty dish rag. What? You picked up a limp vet dish rag is what you just picked up. Instead of a new way of seeing the world, a discussion of infinity. I'll try it again. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. There is a sense, even before this wonderful space in Northrop, um, a sense of, yeah, I want to check that place out. That's an interesting place. It's a, a, the heart of the liberal arts mission of this university. It's a way of doing the humanities, but not the humanities versus anything else, but a humanities-informed way of thinking about everything. So drawing in social scientists, physical scientists, biological scientists, policy people, artists, people from, you know, whatever they do. What is it to think in a way that takes the humanities seriously? Um, develop a taste and a passion for ambiguity, for asking questions that are not going to have clear answers, for asking questions that once you think you've answered them give rise to new questions, for doing the work of interpretation, for not taking it that you know data will settle a question, but you have to ask how were the data framed, what were the questions that were being asked, how are we going to interpret it, how are we going to make sense of it, engaging in the activity of sense making and of troublemaking and of critical thinking, all of that. And so there there is a sense of community, of palpable excitement, and also a sense of openness. It's, it's developed into, I think, in many ways, the heart of the university, and an incredibly exciting place for people to come, whether that means coming to Thursdays at 4, um, or applying and coming, getting to spend time here as a fellow, or, you know, and people from outside the university coming and so on. So it's, it's been astonishingly successful. And, uh, uh, but Dragon Age really was the first game I ever played where I got to the point where you can talk with Krim, and you can do something that I think is really interesting, which is that you can, you can sort of be like a good person about it, you can be smart, but you can also be like stupid. And like ask all the dumb questions that I've been asked, uh, or that specifically you know trans men friends of mine have been asked. Um, and you can throw them out there, and the game comes back at you with the best answers ever. And it's not even like the thing where like this character is like teaching you about trans people. He doesn't go like, well, the thing about trans people is. It's just like they'll just zing you back if you ask a stupid question. And then a related, perhaps not relevant question. Um, you know, my, my understanding, uh, pedestrian understanding, is that there are various, various sort of branches, if you will, of Buddhism uh, have different takes on this question of sort of relics or mm. idols and monuments. Mm. And my, my understanding is that Zen or some parts of Zen Buddhism, mm. you know, reject this partially or entirely. And so I just wondered, to what extent have or were other branches of Buddhism sort of supportive or not supportive or you know, giving a damn at all mm. about about in these conflicts, and you know, I can imagine some someone somewhere going, "Ah, oh, see, if you didn't, you know, worship these bloody idols, you wouldn't have this, exactly. this problem at all." <laughs> so, sorry. In the long days.
start with the Zen and other branches of Buddhism. So this rat's running, he's running actually in this direction. He's going to encounter a 21 second delay to banana, a 10 second delay to the first flavor, and a 28 second to the second, second flavor. And then you know what's coming. He runs around, he checks the banana, and he says, no, I'm not waiting 21 seconds for banana. And then he checks the 10 seconds. And I don't know why he doesn't stay for 10 seconds. 10 seconds is well below this rat's threshold. But now he leaves that 10 seconds, and he comes up, and he hits 28 seconds. And he stops and looks backwards. <laughs> and anthropomorphically, I swear, this rat looks like he's going, damn it. <laughs> it's one of those plants that has a, a very special and ancient communication ability. It's about all we can say for now. So, um, again, if, if you'd like to uh, use some of that, and the tobacco that we have here is also a blend of uh, some of the tobacco that comes from seeds that are 800 to 1,000 years old that um, we've grown. And some of those seeds actually, uh, as Phyllis said, were on the last space shuttle. We would never dare to go into that sacred above direction. We would never go away from our mother, who gives us life. Um, think of umbilical cord like gravity, you know? She holds you pretty tightly. If you, uh, I actually have, I mean, my dad was a paratrooper, so I just, uh, I guess I was always curious, but it wasn't at night and, you know, it wasn't in war, but I, I wanted to jump out, and I did, and uh, my wife says I can't do that anymore. <laughs> She's not with us tonight, but um, my dad would say that's how she loves all of us equally. You know, gravity, you want to put a number on it, you know, 32 feet per second squared, 9.8 meters per second squared. That's how much maka ina, unchi maka, aki, our mother loves us. You have to put a number to quantify the love. Uh, <laughs> Galileo found out, you know, uh, I mean, she doesn't pick favorites, I, you know, it's, uh, anyway. So, how do these seeds know which way is up, which way is down? What about the directions, the directionality? When the seeds germinate, and they won't germinate without water. To be very honest, and I'm, I'm not being critical of uh, necessarily, but NASA is nowhere near ready to grow food in space. That's uh, an extreme understatement. <laughs> they have to bring it all with them. You know, and oxygen. <laughs> That's all. Just make sure you bring enough in your little cup. So, um, and you've seen them kind of blow water drops across, you know, they, you know, right? It's a beautiful mystery. It's a sacred mystery to us. Curiosity is not enough of a reason for us to do science. We do have curiosity. Wasdonia Wachimpi, but we have many stories about our tricksters that were too curious and there were consequences. So we have ethics. We have an axiology that goes with our epistemology and our metaphysics. Those are the three poles of our tipi that support our presence. And so it's in that spirit that these seeds on the last shuttle, rather than the first, and that that shuttle was like a, a canoe, a wata, a wata kiyan, a flying boat but a very special kind of one that goes where the air isn't. And they, they followed our protocol. We, we worked with and it was women at NASA. And uh, there were tears that flowed. And you think of left brain rocket scientists, engineers, right? Um, and yeah, that's the case also. But it was very emotional because, you know, many lives have also been lost for that curiosity. And again, you know, in our way, we would be very humble. And I know that for the families of those cosmonauts and astronauts and the four-legged dogs, the monkeys, we've been going in space for quite a while. And now we're just on the edge of even further, um, I hesitate to use these words, but you know where I'm going. Discovery, 
<laughs> but perhaps colonization, exploitation. Um, and I don't know that any of these protocols will be followed. So when you receive some of these tobacco leaves, know that they, they've come from space. They've come from a place where many of us will never be. And yet, that's where we all came from. You are made of the stuff of stars. All the atoms in our bodies came from stars or from the start of the universe. And so uh, we are stardust. In Dakota, we say we come from the stars to the stars we return. We come from the earth to the earth we return. So we're all relatives between a sky father and an earth mother. And our, our goal is to be the best relative we can be. You know, where do you come from? Where are you going? Where have your objects of knowledge come from? Where were they hanging out before you got hold of them? What's going to happen to your objects of knowledge when you send them back out into the world? And the IAS creates an ongoing, flexible, changing, shifting community within which those questions can be addressed. And those questions are crucial for everybody at the university, no matter what they're doing, no matter what field they're in. But they're questions that don't tend to get addressed within different disciplinary settings. There isn't time, space, or relevant skills, or the people to address those. And so having a center of gravity and an attractive place that draws people to come in to ask the questions that maybe have been nagging somewhere not terribly well formed in the back of their mind and the person over in the next bench in the laboratory is not quite able, it's not the person they need to have that conversation with. And so I think having the IAS as an attractor, as a place for people to bring those questions that keep them up late at night that come up in conversations they have with their neighbor or with the parents of the kids at their, you know, their kids at the school, parents of other kids at their kids' school. Um, where are they going to ask those questions and where are they going to have those questions posed to them? We need a place that's going to keep that vision alive, keep those questions alive, foster those conversations, and be a dazzlingly attractive place for people to bring their questions. This is like a good example of a happy accident where Jackson Pollock's painting kind of matched pretty. I don't know which one's matching, but it seems like a painting matched to them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And they were really interested in these kind of visual images. Uh, in the dark background, really highlighted light thing moving. <laughs> And, and still in the pavilion, um, Madame de Tay, attributing their sudden, sudden passions to the space itself, says, let us leave this dangerous place. Our desires keep multiplying here, and we haven't the strength to resist them. Strangely, she then suggests they visit a cabinet, or little room inside the house, that her husband had designed to, quote, strengthen his affections. <laughs> Hearing her speak about this place, Denon's narrator, in an incredible substitution of architecture for the lover's body, one of the most remarkable statements uh, in erotic fiction of, of the century, um, writes, it was no longer Madame de Tay whom I desired. It was her little room. Und ich frage mich, 
ist, ist es irgendwie so ähnlich mit, mit Kunst, dass man sagt, ja, wenn, wenn, wenn sie wirklich etwas anderes machen können, dann macht das. Ähm, das rate ich eher anderen, die mich fragen, ob sie Künstler werden sollen. Ja. Äh, weil meine Antwort ist dann, diese Frage stellt sich nicht. Wenn du es machen möchtest, ja. dann möchtest du nichts anderes. Ja. Ja? Und dann nimmst du jedes Risiko in Kauf. Das ist die Voraussetzung. Nicht, ob du gut bist, sondern ob du dich so fühlst, dass du das machen möchtest. Und ich muss ehrlich sagen, ich könnte nicht wirklich etwas anderes tun. There is a terrible rule. You can't translate something that you don't understand. It seems, well, of course, no. When you read a poem, Uh, you will say that's so enigmatic, so beautiful. I'm not sure what this poem says, but I like it all the more because, because the sense is half hidden. Uh, and perhaps it means this, perhaps it means that. It's practically impossible to translate such a place or such a poem preserving the riddle uh, in, uh, in it, behind it. Uh, when you translate, you invariably clarify, which is the same as saying that you kill it. Because sometimes the most important thing is that you, it's like the great rule of post-structuralism. You ask, you ask an author, what did you want to say? And the author says, I'm not sure what I wanted to say. Very nice, very nice. If, you, if he doesn't know, then we can do anything we want. We can interpret, reinterpret, and deconstruct. So everything will be then done most beautifully. And that gets to, I think, the most fundamental point about the Institute for me is that it doesn't know what, at least for most of the time I've been with it, it may have changed, I haven't paid good attention to it in the last while, it hasn't known quite what it is. Whatever its mission statement is, whatever its vision statement is, whatever its set of policies is, are they? It doesn't. That doesn't kind of add. It doesn't kind of, kind of sum it up. And so, you know, if I walk in and say, "Let's do something about police dogs," there's no document that says we can't. <laughs> it may be an idea that people don't want to fuss with for whatever reason, but it's, it's it, you know, it, it'll at least get a hearing. Um, I think about, for example, the openness that the Institute showed during the North Minneapolis tornado to some very creative stuff that was being done to organize uh, tornado relief. Um, the Institute was, was all over that. And well, what, what, what can you do to help? Or this is interesting. Can, can we help you push this further? There's an overwhelming spirit of generosity here. It's a place that you can actually get, develop a creative relationship with. And that's very unusual. A woman who wanted her daughter to become a successful courtesan asked Veronica Franco, the most famous courtesan of all, for advice. Franco replied, You've shown her the vanity of bleaching her hair and wearing makeup, and you have displayed her with all the embellishments used to help merchandise find Venice is full of settings, 
especially sodomy, which is recklessly practiced everywhere. The female chorus will inform the patriarch that they cannot make a living because no one goes to them. So random is sodomy. Even all the men are getting down to it. <laughs> Necessity in a world with no guarantees. Necessity to risk and innovate. Um, uh, failure between stagnation and innovation. Um, the one that really got me was failure um, is a form of resistance. Mm -hmm. I thought, oh my God, I see every single one of these every day in high school, you know, and I try, try really hard to like uh, bring it all back to hope. To hope, which I really loved, because that one, in the end, that was like, okay, now I've got my head above water as I'm listening to all this about failure, you know, and so much of it resonated and on so many different levels. Thank you all. It was so inspiring. So, what I think the IS uh, did for me and does for a lot of people is it creates an environment where you can explore new connections, kind of in a, you know, it's, they may not lead to anything eventually. Um, maybe a lot of them may be unsuccessful in some way, um, and that's fine. I had no previous dance background. I didn't see that connection. I never saw it coming. So what I think IS, something like it, can do is provide the opportunities for things to hit you that you never saw coming, to be surprised. And I think that's what academic life needs 
And I think it's important. It's what a big part of life itself. 